the last talk this afternoon is by Pavel Safronov from the University of Edinburgh, and he's going to talk on skein modules for generic quantum parameters. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be speaking here. I haven't had a chance to meet Vaughan, but yeah, I would have liked to meet him and um, explain to him this work, which is um, yeah, closely related to knot invariants he has introduced. So uh, let me begin with the story of the Jones polynomial, which we've already seen uh, several times today. All right. Um, okay, so the Jones polynomial is a sum Laurent polynomial in uh, square root of t, and is determined by its normalization on the unknot and the skein relation. So what happens uh, if you have two different kinds of crossings, you can resolve them. Okay, so the Jones polynomial, um, as you can see, the skein relation for the Jones polynomial uh, doesn't allow you to reduce the number of crossings. Uh, and that's why Kaufman came up with uh, a slightly different version of the Jones polynomial, the Kaufman bracket. So uh, th there's a new variable that's usually denoted by A. So it's again going to be a sum Laurent polynomial. As opposed to the Jones polynomial is defined for framed but unoriented links, while the Jones polynomial is for oriented but unframed links. Okay, and it's again determined by normalization of the unknot and the skein relation. Except that the skein relation is a little bit easier in this case. Uh, on one side you have a single crossing, on the other side you have no crossings. Okay, and then um, the Jones polynomial and the Kaufman bracket, they're related uh, by some rescaling. So if you have a framed oriented link, you can define both the Jones polynomial and the Kaufman bracket, and one of them is a multiple of the other. Okay. So um, next I want to mention skein modules. So again, we've seen them in Helen's talk uh, this morning. Um, and basically, the motivation for the Kaufman bracket skein module is how can you define um, the Kaufman bracket for manifolds other than S, for links in manifolds other than S3? And then you can just uh, sort of generalize the question, and instead of looking for such an invariant, let's just look at the vector space of all links modulo the Kaufman bracket skein relations. So this was introduced by uh, Pritsky and Turayev. So if you have any oriented three manifold, uh, you can look at the vector space spanned by all, fr again, framed unoriented links in the three manifold, uh, modulo the skein relations. So again, uh, th there is a relation that if you see an unknot uh, somewhere in the three manifold, you can remove it at the cost of multiplying by some factor. Uh, and the other scaling relation is, is that uh, if you see a crossing, you can resolve that. Okay, so you have some linear combination like that. Okay, and th uh, the simplest case is for, again, just to go back to the, Kaufman the original Kaufman bracket, if you look at uh, the Kaufman bracket scaling module of S3, then that module, so it's a module over uh, the ring of Laurent polynomials, this module is free, um, and that isomorphism so if you have a framed unoriented link, how do you get such a Laurent polynomial? That's exactly the Kaufman bracket. Okay. And this, the skein modules have been, uh, so they were introduced um, 30 years ago or so, uh, and they've been studied uh, a lot. So we'll mention some more computations of skein modules for other manifolds a little bit later, when I introduce a little bit more notation. Okay, so uh, the mo most of my talk will be about the generalization of the Kaufman bracket skein module. And this is two skein modules where uh, you don't start with a Kaufman bracket skein relation, but more general uh, skein relations. The idea is that if you have any ribbon category, you can generalize the definition of uh, the skein module. Uh, the idea is that uh, instead of looking at links in the three manifold, uh, 
you look at more general graphs in three manifolds. So they're actually ribbon graphs. So there's a, there's a picture of, a, um, of such a graph in a three manifold. So the, the, these are graphs where the edges are labeled, so that all the edges are oriented and uh, they're actually embedded ribbons. I'm not drawing that in the picture. And the edges are labeled by objects of your category. So here's X, Y, Z, and W. Uh, and then the vertices are uh, labeled by morphisms in your category. So here you have four objects and there is one vertex uh, labeled by a morphism from X tensor Y into W. So these are morphisms and objects of the ribbon category. And using work of Rustig and Tarayev, you can actually, um, again, generalize the notion of a scan relation. So you can evaluate uh, these pictures. Uh, for instance, this particular picture can be evaluated to a morphism from X tensor Y tensor Z into Z tensor W. Okay, and that gives rise to scan relations. Okay, and this notion was generalized by Walker, who considered uh, skein modules for manifolds with boundary, but uh, throughout this talk, I'll just look at manifolds without boundary. Okay, and uh, the main example to think about if you wanna go back to the original Kaufman bracket skein module is uh, to consider temporary lead category. So it has already been mentioned, uh, I think yesterday, so if you look at a temporary leap category, this is a category which involves a parameter A. Uh, and if you just plug in into the def definition of this uh, skein module for this ribbon category, you get exactly the Kaufman bracket skein module. So this is not uh, immediately obvious because uh, the skein module I'm talking about here involves potentially uh, some vertices. So it's not a priori generated by links, but the point is that if, if you work with a temporary lead category, you can actually resolve everything and present everything in terms of just links. So this is not true for more general uh, skein modules. And the other example, which is going to be uh, what's relevant for, for this talk, is where you look at the category representations of the quantum group. So in this case, there's a quantum parameter, um, Q, and let me not be specific what, I, what kind of groups I consider, but maybe think about SLN. Okay, so then uh, you have these skein modules uh, for every group, maybe with a little bit of extra structure so that you can make sense of the quantum group. Uh, and then you can just repeat the definition of the skein module where the ribbon category is the category representations of the finite group, uh, the finite dimensional representations of the quantum group. And then you get uh, the skein module associated to the group G. Okay. And th there, there are many works by people in this audience about get, getting a, a diagrammatic presentation for this category uh, of representations of the quantum group for groups other than SL2 and for the corresponding skein modules. But uh, again, the skein model for, uh, for the group G is going to be my main object of interest for this talk. So it's uh, something, some vector space or module over some ring, which is labeled by a three manifold and the group. Okay, so let me mention some properties of, um, of the skein modules. So the first property um, is what happens when you look at actually not at, quantum group, at the representations of the quantum group, but representations of the classical group. So I can just set the quantum parameter to be one and run the definition of a skein module and I'm gonna get some vector space. Okay, so to, to explain what this vector space is, let me first introduce some, um, some interesting spaces. Uh, so the, these spaces are the representation variety and the character variety. So again, uh, th throughout I fix some three manifold M and uh, first of all, I can look at the representation variety, which is just group homomorphisms 
from the fundamental group of the three manifold to the algebraic group G. So this might be a little bit abstract. What this means is that uh, so pi one is some finely presented group. So you have, let's say, n, um, n generators. Uh, and then this is some algebraic subvariety of g to the power n. So there, there are some explicit relations. Um, there are explicit equations for the subvariety given in terms of the presentation of the fundamental group. Okay. This representation variety is um, a very interesting geometric object. It's uh, it's very singular usually. Um, yeah, and I will talk more about this later. And then on g to the n, so as I said, this is a subset of g to the n. On g to the n, you have an adjoint action of the group g. So just look at the diagonal action of g on g to the n. And so then you can look at a quotient of the representation variety by this adjoint action. Um, in this way, you get the character variety. So I'm not going to be very precise what I mean by the quotient. Uh, you can think about this quotient um, in, in some kind of manifold way. Usually it's not, um, yeah, it's, it's not going to be a smooth manifold, but let me ignore those kind of questions. So for now, I just think of this as some singular variety. Okay. Uh, and so th then you, you can ask, what is the skein module uh, just when the quantum parameter is one? So the simplest example of this uh, G skein modules. And it turns out that there's a very easy description of the skein module. Um, basically, you look at this character variety. It's some algebraic variety, so you can make sense of the notion of polynomial functions. So whatever algebraic variety is, it's, it's, it's some geometric object on which you can take polynomial functions. Okay, so you can define the algebra of polynomial functions on this, uh, on this character variety. And the skein module when Q is one is gonna be exactly the algebra of polynomial functions. Okay, so this gives you a very explicit description. And yeah, so, so it's not maybe not t terribly uh, and a very, a very interesting invariant for q equals one of the three manifold because it just sees the fundamental group um, of the manifold. Okay. Uh, but what you, can, what you can deduce from this theorem is some interpretation what the skein module is for an arbitrary quantum parameter. And you can just think of the skein module for the three manifold as a quantization of the character variety. So I will be, I will not say precisely what I mean by this, but let me just say that recently there has been some work to actually make sense of this, what it means to quantize this character variety of a three manifold. So for, when you, when you look at the case of surfaces, so skein modules of surfaces, which are skein algebras that we've heard about, then this story is very classical, uh, goes back to Turayev. But our three manifolds, uh, it's much more involved. So there's no obvious Poisson structure, for instance. Okay, but again, uh, for now, or this is how I think about the skein module. The skein module is some quantum version of the character variety of a three manifold. Okay, so, so here's another property of the skein module, which is gonna be important. Um, so based on some physical intuition, um, Witten conjectured a certain behavior of the skein module. So if you look at this uh, skein module at q equals to one, um, well, it's the algebra of polynomial functions on a character variety. In general, it's some infinite dimensional vector space. Uh, but by, based on some physical intuition, we can conjecture that the skein module is actually finite dimensional when Q is not a root of unity. Okay, and this is what we've proven uh, somewhat recently. Um, let me just state the theorem precisely. The idea is that 
So what, what I mean by generic parameters, so to define the scale module, I have to plug in some ribbon category, and I look at the ribbon category representations of the corner group, and I can just look at this category as linear over any kind of field or any kind of ring, which in, uh, depends on Q. And so here I'm just gonna look at the field of rational functions in, in this Q um, with rational coefficients. Okay, so in this way I create uh, some vector space over this field, which is the scale module for generic parameters. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll keep denoting it by scale superscript generic of M. Okay, and the claim is that uh, you get some finite dimensional vector space. Okay. Okay, so, so this is, uh, let me just again repeat that uh, it's false when Q is one, uh, this vector space is infinite dimensional. It's also false when Q is a root of unity, not one. So uh, there's a very, very classic computation of the scale module for S2 cross S1, and there is, uh, there's a lot of torsion at roots of unity. In particular, if you plug in um, some interesting root of unity, then you get some infinite dimensional vector space. Uh, so that's one, so again, this is a closed, uh, closed three manifold, and the, you look at Q being a root of unity, Another modification you can consider is when the manifold is not closed, uh, but let's say Q is not a root of unity. Uh, again, the, cl the claim is not true. So if you look at uh, a non-compact manifold, which is just sigma, some, let's say, closed Riemann surface cross an interval, then the scale module is, again, the scale algebra of sigma. And the scale algebra is, again, infinite dimensional. So again, uh, Q being a root of unity, not a root of unity and M being closed is important. So the upshot is that uh, what I've produced for you is some finite dimensional vector space, maybe already this field, uh, which depends on a closed oriented three manifold and on the group G. So in particular, you can consider its dimension uh, dimension of the spectra space, and that's some numerical invariant. And basically the rest of my talk will be, um, so the first question I want to answer in the rest of my talk is what kind of information do you see in, from this number or from this vector space? Um, so what can you, see, what can you know, see about the manifold from this generic scale module? So it's, uh, it has a feeling of some quantum invariant uh, of, some, of, of the three manifold, but uh, I'm gonna make more precise what sort of information it sees. Before I do that, uh, let me just list some computations of, um, of, this, of, the, of those dimensions. Uh, uh, yeah. Actually, before I even do that, uh, I just want to just sketch how the theorem is proven. Um, the idea is the following. So, the starting point is this theorem that at q equals to one, you get the algebra of polynomial functions. And then, as I said, when you deform q, you get some quantum version of the character variety. So basically, you want to use ideas from deformation quantization. And to actually implement this, uh, we go down to surfaces. The way this works is that you choose a Hegar splitting of the three manifold. So you write as a union of two handle bodies along a common boundary, sigma. Um, so once you choose a Hegar splitting, you can present the representation variety in a very explicit way. So as I said, it's some, uh, it's some singular variety in general, but in this case, you can write it very explicitly. Uh, if G is the genus of this surface sigma, then you can present it as an intersection of two Lagrangians in some symplectic manifold. So basically, you can look at the group G to the power of twice the genus. This space has a natural Poisson structure, which is generically symplectic. 
So there's an open symplectic cleave in that uh, Poisson variety. And this, in this open symplectic cleave, there are two Lagrangians corresponding to two handle bodies. And these Lagrangians uh, look like the group to the power of the genus. Okay. And the claim is that the representation variety that you get is just the intersection of these two Lagrangians. So then the character variety is just going to be a quotient of that by the group G. Okay, so that, that allows you to understand the character variety uh, in terms of the Hager splitting. Okay, so this is what's happening at Q equals to one. And then when you form Q, you, uh, you perform deformation quantization of this picture. So instead of uh, considering Lagrange intersection, you get some deformation quantization modules. Uh, and then we use some, finite, some standard finiteness results for D modules. So uh, the D modules, you, you can reduce these deformation quantization modules uh, to just ordinary D modules, or modules over the ring of differential operators, and then use some fairly standard results about holonomic D modules to prove this theorem. Let me pause to see if there are any questions. Okay. So, all right. Uh, so now let me get to some numbers. So as I said, in this way, you get uh, some finite dimensional vector space. So you might be interested in its dimension for various three manifolds. Uh, so here are some examples of computations. So first, uh, one of the early examples of the computations is what happens for the land space. So if you just look at the Kaufman bracket scan module of the land space, LPQ, then you get a dimension which is, uh, yeah, uh, the integral part of P over two plus one. So this is due to Hosten and Przytyski. Um, and this is maybe from mid 90s or so. Um, a much more recent result is uh, due to Correga and Gilmer. They've computed the Kaufman bracket scan module, again, for generic quantum parameters for the three torus. Um, and they've obtained uh, that the dimension of this spectra space is nine. Okay, so maybe a, some generalization of the, of the three torus is a Riemann surface of genus G cross a circle. And this is even, even a more recent result. Uh, it was proven two years ago. This is due to Gilmer Masbaum and Detroy Wolf. And so they, they, gave, uh, they gave explicit uh, exponential formula for, uh, for this dimension in terms of the genus. And finally, there's some work in progress by Sam Gunningham, David Jordan, and Monica Vazirani, uh, where they compute the, this, again, generic uh, scan modules for SLN. So they have a very explicit formula for what these scan modules are. So for SL3, you get um, a 29 dimensional space. For SL4, so there's a typo, this is supposed to be SL4, uh, it's 75 dimensional. And they have a yeah, table for all these dimensions. Okay, so you, as you see, you get some interesting vector spaces and interesting numbers. And the question is, uh, what do these numbers actually mean? Do they see uh, anything interesting about the manifold? Okay, so I want to switch gears. Um, and talk about something that might, at first sight might look unrelated, uh, and then I'm gonna relate it back to character varieties and scan modules. So I talked about the character variety and I said that uh, the scan module for Q equals to one is um, just functions on a character variety. And this character variety is some singular, singular variety, but it turns out it has some interesting geometric structure. 
So this structure is called uh, the structure of a decritical locus. Um, so this was introduced somewhat recently, maybe eight years ago by Joyce. I will just sketch um, the main ideas, what this structure means on this variety. Um, so even though th this is some complicated variety, the singularities are controlled in some way. Namely, this variety is locally a critical locus of a function on something smooth. So if you think about a uh, character variety of a three manifold, so you can think of this as being the same as moduli space of flat connections on the three manifold. And the moduli space of flat connections on the three manifold is a critical locus of a function. This function is the chern simons functional on the space of all connections. So this is an infinite dimensional model. And the upshot here is that you, you can also provide a finite dimensional model locally. So there are locally some charts where it looks like the critical locus of some sort of local version of the chern simons function. Okay, so again, this, these are some singular varieties. For singular varieties, you can't make sense of volume forms. But there is a modification uh, precisely because it has this uh, G-critical structure. You can make sense of some bundle of volume forms which depends on this G-critical structure. So I'll just call it a virtual canonical bundle. There's some line bundle over this variety, which you can think of the, this line bundle as the bundle of volume forms. Okay. Uh, and finally, once you introduce this line bundle, you can make sense of uh, what's called orientations of decritical loci. So if, if you're talking about real manifolds and you look at the bundle of volume forms, an orientation is just a choice of a positive basis of the bundle of volume forms. So you can make sense of positive volume forms. Now, if you look at complex line bundles, you, you can't uh, make sense of positive uh, volume forms. But you can replace this notion by saying that you choose a square root line bundle. So if you just repeat this definition, in, instead of saying complex line bundles, real line bundles, the choice of square root is the same as choosing a positive volume form. Um, and so in complex geometry, kind of the analog of the orientation, instead of Positivity, you just choose a square root. So it's just some fixing some signs. Uh, again, I will not, I'm not explaining much about uh, this theory of decritical loci. But the main point which is going to be important is that there is some modification of the usual cohomology of this variety. So the usual cohomology of the variety is uh, some interesting invariant, but this is not what I'm going to look at there's some modification of this cohomology, which depends on the fact that this is actually a decritical locus with some orientation. So an, an example of decritical locus is a smooth variety. Um, in the, if, if the variety is smooth, then this cohomology I'm talking about is just the usual cohomology. But if, there's, uh, if, if the variety is singular, it's some modification de depending on the singularities. So, and the reason uh, Joyce introduced this invariance is uh, to make progress in what's called uh, Donaldson-Thomas theory. Um, so th there was a theory of some invariance of six-dimensional manifolds, so complex three-dimensional manifolds, which are called Calabi-Yau three-folds. Uh, which are some numerical invariants, and there was a proposal that one can categorify them, so one, one can write these numerical invariants as Euler characteristics of some complexes. And these complexes are the categorified Donaldson Thomas invariants. And so Joyce was able to achieve that uh, with his collaborators uh, by observing that some moduli space, some variety that naturally appears in Donaldson Thomas theory, is actually a decreased locus. And so, uh, so th this gives, gave rise to these categorified Donaldson Thomas invariants of Calabi L3 folds. Um, and there are some versions with, for other kind of algebraic structures. You can look at queers with potentials and other 
variants of that. Okay, but uh, in this talk, I'm interested in three manifolds rather than, so real three manifolds rather than complex three manifolds. And so what I want to talk about is uh, a version of this where you use this fact that um, the character variety of three manifolds is actually a decrease locus. And so this was uh, maybe one of the first examples uh, of the, this decrease colossi. So the claim is that the character variety of a closed oriented three manifold is actually such, uh, such an object. Uh, the only thing that's important about the algebraic group is that it has a non-degenerate pairing. So for instance, SLN, GLN, anything like that works. Um, yeah. So as long as we can, so the, and this, this non-degenerate pairing is exactly what's needed to define quantum groups. So th th there's, a, there's a single context uh, for skein modules and for this uh, decrease color structure. Yeah, but uh, so throughout the talk, you can just think of G being SLN. And this is important that M is three Yes, so the question was whether it was important that M is a closed oriented three manifold, and both, well, all, all three adjectives are important. So closed oriented and three are important. Okay. Uh, Okay, so, so is it, right, so this is something rather abstract. Uh, so what can, what can you understand out of this? Uh, one thing you can understand is what, what is this uh, bundle of volume for? So as, as I said, on, on this singular variety, once you know it's a decrease locus, you can make sense of volume forms. Let me just say what it is point-wise. Um, so what I need to tell you is what is the fiber of this complex line bundle at some point and the point uh, in, in this character variety is just a representation of the fundamental group in, in G. So let's, let's say you take a representation, I, I call it script L. So you can also think topologically, these representations are local systems or bundles with a flat connection or something like that. Uh, and then this virtual canonical bundle is what's called the determinant of a cohomology. So this is a, a version of the Euler characteristic where you replace numbers with line bundles or lines. So you write something like the Euler characteristic, except instead of dimensions and sums, you write lines, so determinants of the vector spaces and tensor products. So if you don't know what the determinant of a vector space is, it's just the top exterior power. So given a vector space, you can extract a one-dimensional vector space, which is the top exterior power, and this is what the determinant here is. And then you just apply it uh, degree-wise. Okay, so this is the bundle of volume forms on this uh, singular object. So I mentioned this uh, decrease local structure for a closed-oriented three-manifold, but you can ask, well, what happens if instead of a three-manifold, we can look at a two-manifold, a uh, much more classical case, if, if you look at a closed oriented surface, sigma, and let's say the genus is at least two, then this, this character variety is generically smooth. And this character variety has a symplectic structure due to Atia Bot, Goldman, and other people. And this, the decrease colloquial structure I'm talking about here is actually a generalization of this symplectic structure to three dimensions. So you can think of this as decrease local structure as sort of a shadow of the notion of a symplectic structure where instead of surfaces you work with three manifolds. So this is exactly the kind of thing you want to quantize. So to make sense of skein modules as being quantizations, that's the structure uh, you want to use. Okay, so all right. So, so now, once I said it's a, it has this structure, you can consider this cohomology. Um, again, th this this is not the usual cohomology. This is this is cohomology which depends on the fact that it has this nice structure. 
So this way, you, you, you get some interesting chain complexes or some interesting cohomology groups, uh, which, are, which one might call categorified Donaldson Thomas invariants of three manifolds. Okay, so again, this is closed oriented three manifold. Um, and G is some group like SLN, GLN, and so on, which has a non-degenerate pairing. Okay, so the, there were versions of this considered before. If you look at the case, the group is SL2C, so the simplest example of a complex algebraic group. Um, Abuzid and Malesko have considered a similar setting. So if, if you look instead of the character variety, you look at the representation variety, so just homomorphisms from the fundamental group into G. This is also uh, a decritical locus, and you can define the same kind of cohomology. So they've, they've considered these, um, these kind of cohomology groups, and what they call them is SL2C instant on Fleur homology. It's a framed uh, version. The idea is that the usual instant on Fleur homology is like an SU2 version of the same. So in the usual instant Fleur homology of three manifolds, you consider churn Simons functional on the space of SE2 connections, and roughly speaking, you look at Morse theory of that. Here, the idea is that you want to look at Morse theory of the SL2C version of the same. So you look at space of SL2C, flat, sorry, SL2C connections on the three manifold, and the SL2C churn Simons functional. Okay, so even though analytically, Analytically, this object is kind of difficult to understand just because the space is non-compact as opposed to the SC2 case. There's a replacement for that, which is this cohomology of this sheaf, phi. Okay, so that's, that's a complex analog of instant floor homology of three manifolds. And you can also decategorify this. So if you decategorify instant on floor homology, you get the Cassin invariant. And similarly here, you get some a holomorphic version of the Cassin invariant or a cell to C version of the Cassin invariant. And there was a closer related notion that was defined by Curtis, um, also an SL to C version of the Cassin invariant, except um, she was looking at uh, some irreducible local systems. Okay. So the upshot is that uh, these invariants I'm talking about, you can think of them as complex analogs, at least for SL2, for SL2, of instant floor homology, except it makes sense for all groups in this case. Okay, so, all right, I, I've defined these cohomology groups, uh, but I started my story with skein modules, so it's, let me now relate the two. And let me state a conjecture so it's kind of a conjecture that we formulated and we're also proving. And the conjecture is that if you look at the zeroth cohomology of, uh, of this character variety, so this is some uh, vector space or, or the field of rational numbers. You can base change to the field of rational functions in, um, of some variable Q. The claim is that you get exactly this gain module for generic quantum parameters. Okay. So the upshot is that this gain module actually also for generic quantum parameters also has a description in terms of the same character variety, except it doesn't see sort of algebraic functions on a character variety, but you see cohomology of the character variety. And this is a particular piece of the cohomology. So I said this as a conjecture, it's actually work in progress joint with Sam Gunningham. Uh, the idea is that we want to make sense again of skein module as being quantization of the character variety, and there's a general, more general setting of these decritical loci. And what we prove is that this cohomology that I'm talking about can be thought of as a quantization of um, the character variety. 
or of the decrease locus. So this is related to some uh, works of Saba and Saito. Uh, a priori, this relates to analytic quantizations, uh, and then there's some sort of analytic algebraic comparison um, to relate to algebraic quantizations. And finally, there's an already established link that I already talked about, how to understand skein module as some differential quantization. You choose a Hager splitting and write it as intersection of two Lagrangians. Okay, so that's the outline. Okay, so uh, again, let me just repeat that the scaling module at q equals to one is just the algebra of functions on the character variety. And here for generic quantum parameters, it also sees the character variety, except it sees the cohomology of the character variety in this kind of funny version of the cohomology. Uh, it's not important. Uh, yeah, so basically, you just want to prove that if, if you work with algebraic or analytic quantizations, you get the same answer. So we just need to find a nice enough competitivation with, with nice kind of Poisson properties. Okay. So, all right, so I, I said that the character variety is... Uh, is the decritical locus, but to find this uh, modification of the cohomology, you don't just need a decritical locus structure, you also need these signs that I mentioned. So you need to choose an orientation of this, um, of the character variety. So let me just explain uh, how to think of the orientation on a character variety. So there, there was a general work, uh, recent work by Joyce and Upmeyer Was, it, was there a question? So, so there's a recent work by Joyce and Upmeyer um, studying orientations on just general gauge theoretic moduli spaces. Now, um, but this, this character variety actually is something homotopy theoretic. It just sees the fundamental group and you can ask, well, yeah, can you just understand some orientation, the choice of an orientation in terms of the final group. So the claim is that uh, if M, so if M is just a homotopy type, so if you know just the fundamental group, you can define the character variety. But if M is what's called a simple homotopy type, so I'll mention this uh, notion on the next slide, I'll unpack what this means, then you actually get a volume form. So not just uh, a choice of volume form after, after scale, like a notion of positive volume form, but you actually get a global volume form. So there, there's actually something stronger than an orientation, but in particular, you have an orientation. So actually, this cohomology that I was talking about is well-defined. And this volume form is something rather classical. It uses, um, so if you just look at point-wise what this volume form is, it's the right amice torsion of the three manifold. Okay, so let me now say a few words about simple homotopy types. Uh, so this is a very classical notion. It was introduced 70 years ago by Whitehead. Um, so it involves several pieces. Let me just go through them. Okay, so first, there's a finiteness condition on a homotopy type. Um, of course, if you just have a random topological space, you can't make sense of its Euler characteristic or this kind of invariance because it might have infin infinitely generated fundamental group, infinitely generated homologies. But there's a certain finiteness uh, notion which is called a finitely dominated space. Uh, this is just a property of this space being finite. And uh, basically, if you have a retract of a finite CW complex, maybe up to homotopy, then it's what's called a finally dominated space. Okay. The next level of finiteness is when you ask to actually not be, not be a retract of a finite CW complex, but actually homotopy equivalent to a finite CW complex. 
And there's a k-theoretic abstraction for that. So there's a, a class in reduced k-theory of the group algebra of fundamental group. Uh, here I, I just look at the Grothendieck group, k naught. Uh, module of the integers, so that's why it's reduced uh, algebraic k-theory. And there's a class which is called Wall's finance abstraction. And this vanishes if and only if it's actually homotopy equivalent to finance value complex. And next, once this class vanishes, you can make sense of uh, the space, this homotopy type being a simple homotopy, simple homotopy type, so that's an extra structure. Again, the abstraction for this extra structure is Wall's finance abstraction. Uh, I will not define what it means uh, to have a simple homotopy type, but let me just say what the set looks like. The set of the structures of this being a simple homotopy type carries a free and transitive action of what's called the whitehead group. So the whitehead group is again some k theory invariant. Uh, so it's a quotient of the first uh, algebraic k-theory of the group algebra. Okay, so we'll say a word how this works for three manifolds in a second, because there are very simplifications uh, in the case of three manifolds. Okay, but yeah, so that's the notion of a simple homotopy type. So the first fact is that uh, if you look at closer into three manifolds, then this simple homotopy equivalence is actually the same as homeomorphism. But it's kind of an algebraic, um, yeah, sort of homotopy theoretic um, expl explanation of homeomorphism. And second, in various examples, you can, you can, this uh, structure of a simple homot homotopy type is actually unique on various manifolds. So if you have a three manifold, which is prime, so uh, prime just means it's not a connected, non-trivial connected sum of two three manifolds, and it's not a quotient of S3 by some finite group, so it's not a spherical three manifold, and this fundamental group is actually torsion free, then this structure of a simple homotopy type is actually unique. So this white hat group is trivial in this case, and so there's a unique simple homotopy type. So basically, in this case, when the fundamental group is torsion free, you can just forget about uh, the story about simple homotopy types. Okay. Okay, and now let me just explain how you can try to compute and sort of what, what is the meaning of this generic scan module in terms of sort of classical invariance and classical geometry. So first, uh, if, you, if your manifold is a connected sum, there's an easy formula relating these cohomologies for, uh, for the two pieces. So actually, it's enough to compute uh, this kind of cohomology and the generic scan module for prime three manifolds. So second, if uh, the manifold is spherical, so it's a quotient of S3 by some finite group, well, this, this fundamental group is finite. So in this case, this character variety is just a joint unit of points. And in this case, this cohomology is, again, very easy to compute, or sort of straightforward to compute. And finally, if the group is infinite, but torsion-free, again, you can forget about this uh, story about simple homotopy types. And so this generic skein module it just depends on this finite presented group, which is the fundamental group, and uh, the fundamental class of M. So there's some algebraic input, which is this finite presented group, and uh, sort of, yeah, the fundamental class of the three manifold, which is a class in the third group homology of um, the fundamental group. And so, Presumably, once you have pi one, this class, and the group G, there should be some straightforward way to compute it. So, yeah, we haven't figured it out yet. Okay. Let me say a few words 
about some other uh, interesting, thing about, uh, interesting things about this generic scan module. So here I fix the group G and I ask the question, what does it see about the three manifold? So I'm gonna do the other way. I'm gonna fix the three manifold and try to understand something about the group G. So how does it change when you look at different groups G? Okay, so we have some uh, big program about Germanic Langlands program for three manifolds. So I'm not gonna explain much about it. Let me just say a few words about it. Um, so let's say you have a group which is something like SLN or SON. So connected and semi-simple. Then you can define what's called the Langlands dual group. And if you know, uh, if you know roots and weights and co-roots and co-weights, basically this data is symmetric and you can just exchange the notion of roots and co-roots and weights and co-weights. Then you can reconstruct another group. That group is the Langlands dual group. Okay. So uh, it's, it's kind of a duality for groups. One fact is that if you look at the center of the dual group, then it's essentially the fundamental group of the original group, except it's the Pontragian dual of this fun, uh, fundamental group. Okay, so the, 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 these are both finite groups, uh, the fundamental group and the center, and they're exchanged by Langlands duality. Okay, and the, the examples uh, you can think about are uh, so SLN is Langlois dual to what's called PGLN. So it's just GLN mod its center. And another example is um, SO2N plus one is Langlois dual to the symplectic group, uh, SP2N. Okay, and part of these uh, Langlois conjectures is the claim is that this cohomology should actually be symmetric under the exchange of G and G check. Okay, so this is maybe a little bit abstract. Maybe more, something more concrete is that, well, as I said, if you look at H naught on both sides, you get the scan module for generic parameters. So uh, a corollary of this should be that the scan modules for generic quantum parameters should be isomorphic. So in particular, they should be vector spaces of the same dimension. And that's something you can actually check um, what these vector spaces are. So before I explain one example of this computation, I'm just gonna ref refine this conjecture a, a little bit more to actually maybe see a little bit more structure rather than just an isomorphism of two vector spaces of the same dimension. Okay, and for this, there's actually a, a certain grading on the scan module. Um, right, so I don't have time to say much about it, but um, okay, so let's look at just the Lie algebra To a semi-simple Lie algebra, you can associate a certain finite group, uh, which I call gamma here. One way to think about this is that you take a simple connected group, which integrates this Lie algebra, and take its center. Or you can look at what's called the adjoint group, so the group module its center, and then you can look at the fundamental group of that. So then you get this finite, um, finite group gamma. And there's a natural grading uh, of the scan module by this gamma. So this grading was actually what was used uh, in various computations of scan modules, for instance, for a surface crosses one in the case of SL2. And the idea is that uh, now if I don't fix the group, but I actually fix a Lie algebra, there's a bi-graded version of the scan module. So won't say much about it, parameterized by homology classes with coefficients in gamma and gamma dual. This is the contracting dual of gamma. Uh, 
And then you can extract the simple connected version of the scan module if you just sum over the first index and uh, adjoint form of the scan module if you sum over the second index. Okay. Now under Langlois duality, gamma exchanges with its Pontryagin dual. So it makes sense to formulate the following conjecture that, yeah, under this Langlois duality that I mentioned, th these gradings uh, get exchanged. Okay, so this is still kind of looks complicated in general, but then you can just look at the case when the Lie algebra is self-dual. So for instance, you can look at type A, so SLN, then SLN, the Lie algebra SLN is Langlois dual to itself, and then this claim just becomes the fact that there's a, some symmetry of this bigraded scheme model. Okay, and that's something you can actually check uh, in various examples. So let me just explain um, how this works in the case of SL2 and surface crosses one, where this kind of bigrading is completely known. Um, then you can just look at the table of these dimensions of this generic skein module. So you can take uh, th these A and B gradings to be yeah, various parameters. You can either take it zero or you can take some non-zero value. And then, yeah, as you see, this table just uh, is completely symmetric. So that's an instance of this uh, Langlois duality. Now you might say, okay, well, that is not much of an evidence, but then you can just see what it actually means and for instance, you can try to see what is comparison of these two vector spaces. So this vector space, this g-dimensional vector space here and this g-dimensional vector space here. So what is the meaning of the corresponding vector spaces? One vector space, so this first column, actually the whole first column, but in particular this vector space, was computed by Gilmer Masbaum and Detroit Wolf. It, it involves some topological computation of uh, links in sigma crosses one. And they just observed that this vector space is g-dimensional and they've given explicit basis for this vector space. This other entry, uh, I don't know the topological computation of this entry, but there's a geometric computation of this entry. So you can actually see that uh, there's a simple argument to show that this scan module in this entry is actually some cohomology group of some manifold. So you can look at what's called the twisted character variety uh, of the surface sigma, and you can look at its cohomology. So this twisted character variety is actually a manifold as opposed to the ordinary character variety. Uh, so this is manifold, has complex dimension 6g minus 6, so I'm going to look at middle dimensional cohomology of this complex manifold. Um, and this computation was done by Hitchin, and this entry is actually that computation. So there's a, yeah. So the upshot here is that this, equal, this isomorphism between these two entries is given by comparing this vector space, which is cohomology of some manifold, and some topological computation in terms of links in signal crosses one. And then maybe just let me end with a sort of trip, triptych remark. This cohomology of this manifold, so this is a non-compact manifold, the, this cohomology carries a mixed Hodge structure. And you can ask what, what is, uh, how does this mixed Hodge structure look like? Uh, it turns out that you can actually write a basis and th these basis elements have a specific weight. And you can see also a natural basis on the other side. Uh, so this was what, what was computed by Gilmer and Masbaum. And they've attached another set of numbers to these basis elements, so there, there are some links in sigma cross this one by computing a wittner chicken drive invariance of these links. So you can evaluate this wittner chicken drive invariance uh, of these links at some roots of unity. In this way, you can attach some other set of weights. 
And it turns out that these weights actually agree. Um, so we don't have an explanation and we also don't have a general conjecture what uh, the behavior of weights is under Langer's duality, but there is this interesting observation. Okay, so I'll stop here, thanks. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Pavel. Um, questions uh, from the audience, or are there any people online? Oh. Um, about this last conjecture, I'm not quite sure. You, you just uh, conjecture that the dimensions are the same, or there is some natural map between the vector spaces. I, I guess it might be related to your last comments on the basis, or, or, or maybe not. Yes, so, uh, we don't have a natural map at the moment. Um, just like for, so there, there are analogs of Germanic language conjectures for surfaces about some equivalence of categories. So a priori, there is no natural equivalence of categories. Uh, the way they're formulated is that you just for, say there's an equivalence of categories and then there's some natural structures on both sides and you can match those natural structures on both sides. So it's expected that, so we don't have a, the cleanest definition of these conjectures, but uh, it's expected that there's an isomorphism which is compatible with various structures. So one of the structures is what I was mentioning here, this mixed hot structure. Thank you. Any uh, further questions? Thanks. In that case, let's uh, thank Pavel very much.